Chip. Who's associated with this organization, for those of you who don't know Jill. Thank you for the presentation. Just two points. What was the last one about the job working on the 4th of the schedule? And you said the law of the sea needs to reform in these areas. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. And the second one was just the issue of sanctions for employers of um, illegal immigrants. Is, is that sort of an important feature for the one at a time. As far as the the law of the sea is concerned, it became clear to me after a period of time that there were many people migrating to Europe by sea, uh, often across the Mediterranean and elsewhere. But the ability of law enforcement in general to engage with that, uh, often, by the way, in near slave conditions. I mean, really, uh, they are really the modern equivalent of the slave trade. Uh, is what is happening. Uh, but the ability in international waters of any law enforcement agency to be able to engage in that is extremely limited. Uh, I understand why that has been the case historically, but I don't think it really works in the current era. There are more particular examples, of, for example, the piracy off the Horn of Africa, where there are also some issues about the ability to intervene. And there were some complicated issues, like the Royal Navy, for example, the UK Royal Navy, said that it couldn't uh, intervene with a certain ship, because if they intervened, then the people would then, in the ship, who were the people being trafficked, would immediately have the right to residence in the UK uh, uh, forever uh, type of thing. And so that stops it happening. And I just think there's a set of issues, which I don't understand in full, which, but do require a reassessment of how the law of the sea, set up in rather different circumstances, uh, does in fact operate in relation to these. Uh, and as I say, I don't think it should be underestimated the terrible conditions that some people are being transported in by sea to come into the EU, really shocking uh, to, to see. As far as the, the broader issues are concerned, it is difficult. The uh, way in which the European Convention on Human Rights has operated and the question of what is a human right and prevention of torture and so on has gradually been d expanded, the definition, basically by the jurisprudence of the court decisions themselves in recent years. And uh, it does require, and, and has led to a quite serious position. For example, I sat around the cabinet table uh, in Tony Blair's government, and there was a serious discussion about whether the UK should leave the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, Michael Howard, who was then the leader of the opposition, thought we should uh, leave the European Convention of Human Rights. I think this would be a terrible thing. But the fact is that unless you can get it, the convention working in a way that relates to the modern conditions, it won't be, it'll be more difficult to defend what's happening. And there's been a process launched following a meeting of the Council of Europe in Turkey, I think it was last year, to try and look more carefully at how it could operate. It's very difficult to secure reform because it requires agreement of all governments, of course, and that's very difficult to achieve. But I think it is important to put it on the agenda. Um, and uh, it, it, again, for the same reason, I, uh, the, the, the total presentation I've made, actually, which is that these things have to have the confidence of the peoples of the countries. Uh, at the end of the day, if they don't have the confidence of the peoples of the countries, then you're always liable, or there's always a risk of being in a position that you get overthrown by the opinion of people in, in certain countries. And that means the, 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 whole net, the whole range of legal frameworks are seriously undermined. As far as sanctions on employers are concerned, I'm in favour of very strong sanctions on employers. Um, but I think the way to tackle it is through work conditions and the question of how strongly you enforce the basic labour law of uh, the conditions in which people work. Um, again, to take the UK example, I don't know to what extent it's true in Ireland, uh, there have been some appalling cases of people working in the most appalling situations. One of the most famous was the cockle pickers in, in Morecambe Bay uh, who perished as a result of the situation. And it was really because the, uh, the gang masters who controlled that were not subject to effective legal regulation in what they operated. They absolutely had no care for their employees, or not even employees really, the people who worked for them. Um, and uh, as a result, people died. And I think that there's a relatively small group of employers who behave in a very unacceptable way, uh, and we need to have strong sanctions. When I was MP for Norwich South in, uh, in Britain, we had a very difficult case of people who uh, sanctions being taken against restaurateurs who were employing illegal uh, uh, Chinese immigrants. And they were very upset. They came to me and uh, said, this is completely wrong, and so on. They had a whole set of explanations, uh, which had some weight. 
But at the end of the day, my position, I'm afraid, was that actually the law needs to be enforced strongly, and that requires people who employ in bad circumstances, including employing legal immigrants, should not be permitted to do it. So I take a, a very strong line on that. Thanks, Charles. Tom. Um, thank you very much. Fascinating presentation. Um, well, Tom Hoy, who's the, the treasurer of this institution. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for paying. Thank you for paying for the hotel. <laughs> um, in, in this scenario of interest to me, but uh, it, particularly from the perspective of your area of comment about um, the findings of the Suarez group, uh, uh, Europe will need tens of millions yeah. of migrant workers. Uh, and if if you actually start from that perspective, it becomes how do we actually structure? Uh, a situation that permits people who have been uh, cared and vetted to come to, to Europe uh, and therefore that they wouldn't have to cross the border between Turkey and Greece or across the Mediterranean Correct. to Malta that they could actually come wherever the, the need is greatest. Although ironically I believe that this is one of the countries that will have the biggest deficit in terms of mm. However, uh, I, I would like to make a, a couple of quick comments because I, I was involved as an advisor at European industry level at the time of the single market. And I know that uh, Ireland actually happily embraced free movement of people in Europe. And Mrs. Thatcher came out of the conference room and said, no, it doesn't mean we're getting rid of passports at all at all, much to the consternation of everybody else. And I do believe that for most of the intermediate period, if not right now, that Ireland uh, would have to join Schengen if the UK had joined Schengen. And because I, I was an executive director at Dublin Airport, I also know that the lion's share of illegal migrants to Ireland uh, before we leave post controls came from the UK. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's why the controls were really introduced on Ireland UK. Which is well, just to say, I mean, firstly, I completely understand the last point you made. It's, it's uh, completely right. Um, but the, I think the interesting part of your question, really interesting part of your question, is what will be the labour needs of the European Union over the next 30 or 40 years? Um, there are already a wide range of different schemes to encourage people to work in the EU more or less legally. In Poland, there's a lot of schemes for Ukrainians to come in the summer. Um, Latin America, uh, many people come from Latin America to Spain and Portugal on some kind of basis. There are various schemes of what's called circular migration, where people come for particular short terms to meet particular skills and needs. But I think the thing which nags away at me most is the experience of the UK, where it's absolutely clear there is a section of the population, let's say for the sake of argument, 15%, who actually are completely socially excluded, who actually are not able, for whatever reason, to get work. And in their absence of ability to do that work, migrants come in and do it. It's not at all obvious why uh, a young Polish woman can wo work in a bar in London and get the job and do very well, whereas uh, a uh, young woman from Peterborough uh, can't do that. What's the reason? What's, 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 what's happened? Uh, and I'm absolutely certain that the long-term argument for that, if you're talking 20 or 30 years, is to improve what we do to ensure that the young people in, in this country, in the UK, in Ireland, uh, are able to take jobs in the labour market very directly, and that's the way to make it happen. I don't think on the current basis, if you simply exclude migration into the country, that that works, because at the end of the day, the people I'm talking about don't end up doing the jobs. It's not the, it's not the fact that it's... Uh, that they're, there's a, that they're losing the competition, they're not even competing. But that raises absolutely major fundamental questions about the way, our, the way we are able to ensure that the whole of our populations are able to do competent jobs at different levels. And it's not only a question of young people, it's also a question of how l late in life people work as the population gets older. What do we think about raising the retirement age? What do we think about people working to 70 rather than 65, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And these are, of course, enormous and big questions. Um, and I, the problem about all the speculation, including the Felipe Gonzalez report, is there's all kinds of speculation about where it might be, but based on quite dodgy economic models, I would say, about what the position's going to be. 
I would also argue that a failure of the European Union has been the uh, Lisbon programme, which was about economic growth and regeneration. I don't think that's really succeeded. And so I think the priority in, in Labour is to focus on the people who currently live in the European Union, really to ensure they can all do the jobs, uh, have the capacity to do the jobs which are here. And that's a bigger priority than migrating more people into the EU, uh, into that situation. But it's also a much more difficult priority because the truth is there are many people coming from India or China who've got tremendous capacity to work here. And it's a lot easier to say, let's bring somebody from Mumbai in than it is to get somebody who's a, a, a socially excluded person in uh, Peterborough or Cork to, up to the level to do that kind of job. And so we all duck it. But I think that's an, a question we can't keep on ducking at the end of the day. Thanks, Charles. The gentleman at the back first. Shubham yeah. Amara, just uh, on your mention of Turkey, you mentioned that Turkey uh, should be in European Union and it might help uh, battle the border with Greece. Uh, but doesn't it in turn create a massive problem of having the European Union right in the border of Iraq, present day Syria, and other countries beyond it as well uh, to the east? So, wouldn't you in fact magnify the problem by having this massive border? Uh, with very difficult territories beyond? I don't think so myself. Um, I agree that the issue is a real one. The argument's put in slightly different terms by some of the big leaders. I remember when I was, interior, when I was Home Secretary, Nicolas Sarkozy was Interior Minister, and he argued very in private, very, very directly, that the EU was a Christian continent and we didn't want Muslims coming in, thank you very much. And that's why we couldn't have Turkey. Now, I think that simply is not an appropriate way to look at what, it, what is the EU today, which is a very diverse community in all kinds of ways. Or I remember the Prime Minister of Bavaria saying to me, we had this argument about Turkey coming in. He said, the time's not right, it's not ready yet. And uh, we were doing this at a dinner in Berlin. And he, uh, I said, well, if now's not right, when would be right? And he said, the year 3000. I've never forgotten. Uh, and, it was absolute, uh, and, and this was... This was an extremely influential finger, finger in Angela Merkel's uh, coalition uh, government. And you can I, I accept you can decide we never want Turkey. Um, and it would, in, in many ways, it would be better to make that decision rather than to keep the thing going, teetering on. I would not say we should take that decision, however, because I think the consequence of saying to Turkey, we don't want you, and much of their aspiration is European is to drive them into a different position in relation to all the countries you're, you're describing, which in fact is happening now to an extent, uh, where they see that as their point of reference rather than Europe as their point of reference. And I think we, we would be in a stronger position if Turkey saw us unequivocally as their centre of reference, which they don't at the moment because they know all these signs uh, that I've just described, uh, and uh, weren't distancing themselves from us. And I think in terms of dealing with situations in Iraq, Syria, or wherever it may be, we do much better with Turkey as a strong part of our group, as of course has been the case in relation to NATO uh, since uh, shortly after the, World War, the, the, the Second World War. Uh, I think we'd be in a much stronger position that way round rather than the other way round. I think the other thing I'd just like to emphasise is the point I made earlier. Most people, if you went out on the street here or you went out on the street in London, would say the people coming into the EU from Turkey are Turkish. Actually, that's not the case. And we would do a lot better to have a stronger external border at the border of Turkey than we do on this border to make sure that Turkey itself was not subject to many people coming through uh, from many of the countries you're talking about. But I, 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 I'm now of the strong view that we should encourage Turkish membership and go to, to, to carry through what actually the EU's already decided. And I also think the current uncertainty about implementing what the EU's already decided is damaging. But I will concede to you your argument that there is a case for saying we shouldn't, that they shouldn't be in. But then in that case, I think we'd do better to say right now they're not in. Could I ask you to follow up? How would you persuade the Germans, the Austrians, and so on to change their minds about Turkey? Well, Germany and Austria is slightly more complicated, despite what I said, because of the very large Turkish population within those countries. And um, the relationship between the leadership of Germany, who've made some in interesting recent visits to Istanbul, and uh, the Turkish question is probably much more intimate than certainly the UK's and probably, I dare say, Ireland's as well. And so I think it's quite possible that at the end of the day they would recognise it's in their national interest in terms of their countries to have a Turkey within the EU. Um, France is slightly more difficult. Um, I think that there's a... 
there's an unhealthy, and this is an undiplomatic thing to say, so I say it with great hesitancy with you here because you're a diplomat through and through in every aspect of your, uh, your being. Um, I don't think the French are facing up to these kind of issues in the way that they need to at all. And they're fighting battles on ban the burqa and all the rest of it uh, from an entirely populist angle led by Nicolas Sarkozy, which I think is very damaging to proper debate about these things. Um, and that has to change, that's all. Thank you, Charles. The lady here, please. Hi, um, I'm part of one of the silent community I see. Um, the, I'm just curious as to like the uh, measures that you outlined um, are surely those that tackle symptoms and not causes. Um, you know, if you start to look at causes, it's quite easy. To, you know, you, you, you follow the money. Um, and perhaps measures of regulating multinational corporations, remittances and, uh, of, of profits from, from countries and leaving more money in the countries. It's the flow of wealth that the people are following. You know, if, 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 that, if there was regulation on that flow of wealth all coming to, to Europe and it, instead of staying in the countries where a lot of natural resources are extracted, it might prevent what you described as all those horrible people wanting to come. I didn't say all those horrible people. Yeah, it was um, that UK and Ireland felt that that because they were surrounded by sea, it would stop all those horrible people coming by land. Um, well, that, that was said with Ireland. <laughs> well, that was said with Ireland. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If, uh, I certainly don't think they're all those horrible people. And for what it's worth, I agree with everything you said. I do think I'm talking about symptoms, not causes. I do think the causes are in a globalised world how the economic relations operate across the world. Uh, I also think that both trade and aid policies are uh, to achieve a more equitable economic development across the world is the way to do it. Um, however, I observe, and I'm, I'm sure you would agree, that if you look at the various efforts to achieve economic growth, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, there are many, many obstacles on the route to doing that, uh, which aren't only the, UK, the, the world multinational corporations. There are the world multinational, multinational corporations, but also many, many other serious issues about where the money goes and how it operates in those countries, which are entirely real and, and significant problems. But if you make the general point, which you did, that it's about symptoms, not causes, well, I agree. And if you then make the further argument that you have to address the causes, well, I agree with that too. Um, and I believe that right back to when I was a student doing economics and looking at the various UNCTAD reports uh, in various countries of the world, uh, the question of how you stimulate economic growth and what you do is absolutely central to this. Um, but I, you, you can take a position, I'm, I'm not sure if you take it, probably not, that there should be no migration controls at all. There should be no border controls. We live in a world economy, and the way, the way to deal with that is to uh, let everybody travel freely throughout the world looking for work or whatever it may happen to be. I don't myself think that's a realistic uh, policy at all. Um, and I think if you have borders at all, then you have to decide how you're going to police them, what the rules are and how it operates. And they have to be uh, operated with the cooperation agreement support of the peoples of the countries concerned. The question that you, the other question that you raised, I think, is a very interesting question and insufficiently researched, which is the question of remittances. Uh, the issue of remittances, for example, from the Turkish community in Germany to Turkey and how that operates is a highly relevant part of economic development discussions. Um, and I believe that I'm open to correction on this. There's been a relatively small amount of academic work done on this to understand really how remittances have worked as a result of migration. And when you talk about circular migration schemes, for example, as I was saying in answer to uh, Tom's earlier point, um, you can have quite interesting uh, examinations of how the remittances from a period of employment in the EU can help the economic development in the country from which the individuals have come. And that requires quite a lot of thought process. But if you, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I actually agreed with most of what you said, except the attribution to me of a set of uh, views which are not mine, um, which, um, but as, as I'm in politics, I'm very familiar with that. But I'd hoped here in Ireland that never happened. I thought that you, you, you were the model of the perfect political community, unlike we corrupt individuals in London, and uh, it wouldn't happen. But apart from that remark, I agreed with what you said. Uh, but I, I, I don't know if the consequence of what you were saying was really we shouldn't worry about immigration policies, we should just go for the causes. Uh, I say we've got to go for both the causes and the symptoms. Thank you. Uh, can I just switch? Uh, Willie Skelly, who's a Willie member Sorry, of the Institute. Uh, 
member of the Institute, which uh, uh, I just want to switch a little bit to the economic drivers. I mean, just make one preliminary point for context that populations, you're right, the EU of migration, obviously the EU from outside the EU. But in terms of what populations feel, uh, you know, migration inside the EU is, is also highly relevant. Uh, you can find other, obviously, people with other differences. But that, that is an issue. In, in, in Ireland, you know, and in the UK, we did adopt a uh, sort of a liberal policy on enlargement just seven or eight years ago to accelerate entry from the, the, the um, newly uh, entering countries. And that was for economic reasons, that was labour supply reasons. I mean, the Irish economy was growing, you know, we were on, on the cusp of what we thought was an eternal wave. And, uh, you know, you need the foreign labour to let it in. And it wasn't in the context of a well thought out integration, a sort of social education or integration uh, sort of approach here. And you do get, therefore, I think, in the economic drivers, the sort of class differences. If you want to say the wealthy are quite happy with immigration, with immigrants, because you know, they may serve in shops, or they may be nannies, or they may be old pairs, maybe whatever, or and they may be cheap labor for their industries. In terms of uh, less uh, well-off communities, uh, immigrants are seen, in the economic sense, very often as competitors, and also quite often as, uh, you know, having priority on social services, uh, and, and holding, up, holding up queues and so on. Now, all that, I, I think, in the context of Europe, uh, the economy of Ireland, uh, and, and you would get you would get people who would say you know that the, the media and that what people say in public doesn't reflect what people feel. And in, 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 in the continent, obviously, it's different because in places like Holland, that you talked about, the thing is out of the open. And I'm not saying the Irish are racist or anything. I don't think we are. But I I, I think there are problems connected with uh, this uh, uh, emphasis on migration for economic reasons. Without a sort of the, the cultural education or social, a sort of integration uh, that should go with it, and that would maybe particularly in the, in the, in the context of a recession in Europe. I mean, European output is barely at 2007-2008 levels now, and you know the short-term growth prospects, let's face it, are poor. And it's just would you like to comment on that whole uh, sort of integration area, yeah. not just the migrants from outside the EU, but for on the internal sort of shifts of population inside the EU itself? Firstly, um, I need to emphasize that this piece I've done is entirely about migration into the EU. I completely agree with your point. There is a massive issue about migration within the EU, and other word, various words are used, like integration and so on, to deal with it, which I'm also interested in. I do quite a lot in, but this wasn't addressed here. Um, now, what do I think about migration within the EU? Firstly, I think it's very difficult to talk about a common EU policy across this because the different uh, cultures and different communities within the EU are very, very different. Um, Cork is very different from Marseille, is very different from um, Tallinn, uh, and so on. And trying to, try to suggest one can have the similar policies in each of these areas I don't think is correct. But you have to have a positive approach towards integration. You have to have a positive approach towards en enabling people to live side by side and work together. Um, I believe that uh, much of the criticism of what happened when the A8 countries uh, were given the access to come in is overblown. In Britain, for example, classically the Polish plumbers uh, and so on. Um, I would say, and I was Home Secretary during the time, there is very little evidence that actually the arrival of the Poles and the Baltic uh, citizens uh, really damaged the labour market in a significant way. But I agree with you that people have a perception that it does and also have a perception that their fundamental social services, that are, they're being deprioritised. Um, actually, again, I looked at this in detail in many cities in Britain and I simply think it wasn't the case, but people believed it was the case and therefore it's important to, to, to address it and take it seriously. So I do think you have to have a set of policies which really address the issues and you go through them in some detail. Uh, and I believe that's entirely possible, and I think certainly in Ireland, certainly in the UK, there's some very successful examples of policies which have worked in various ways. I also agree that only a very small minority of people are, would I would really describe as racist in a serious way. There are, of course, racists who are genuinely racist in what they do, uh, but in most cases, uh, people are frightened of change happening in various ways, and they take out their fears in terms of the, the potential changes that are coming. 
How do you deal with that? You have to try and reduce the fears that people have. That's why I wrote this pamphlet, because I think one of the fears that people have is that migration or immigration is essentially anarchic, is happening. People don't know what's happening, they don't know who's entitled to be here, they don't know why they came here, they don't know why they can't go home, etc., etc., etc. And I think that governments have a duty, and I believe it's best done at an EU level, to establish a set of rules where everybody understands exactly what those rules are and how they operate. And if that happens, I think that reduces potential opportunities for racism in various uh, circumstances, uh, which is why I argue that. But that's also true when you're talking about housing waiting lists or schools or whatever it may happen to be, illustrating that actually the, the, what exists can exist in a multicultural society where people, uh, as in many London schools, there are literally hundreds of languages spoken in some London schools. Does this make them worse schools? My children attended one of these schools. In fact, they made them far better schools because you had people coming from a wide variety of different backgrounds to those uh, in, the, in those circumstances but more difficult schools, more difficult for the teachers, more difficult for the students, in some cases more difficult for the parents. And you've got to give support to help people uh, provide the best education in those circumstances. And as I said earlier on the jobs competition front, I think that's about ensuring that everybody's able to compete for the jobs which are available. And I think that means dealing with the fact that certain communities are essentially completely excluded uh, from that uh, process. We know between Britain and Ireland there have been all kinds of, quotes, integration, unquotes, issues between uh, British and Irish people in these two islands over the last hundred years. Uh, not always easy to resolve, sometimes very unpleasant, leading to very unpleasant s situations. But people simply have to work at trying to achieve a situation where people can live together. And in our cases, it wasn't an issue of skin colour or whatever, but it was an issue of different cultures and different circumstances, which did lead to tensions in some cities, uh, which have, uh, thank goodness, been resolved over, uh, over, or never say resolved, moved towards being resolved over time. And I think that's what's required, a kind of consistent effort to uh, ensure that people can live side by side without the fears being there. Um, but I'm more optimistic about this. I believe that actually there's a lot of evidence of people having worked reasonably successfully in these areas and an ability to deal, with, uh, to deal with the problems that exist in a reasonably constructive way. Thank, thank you, Charles. This will have to be the last question. No. Thanks, uh, Noel Waters, uh, Head of Immigration here in, in Ireland and Dublin. And thank you, Charles, for, uh, for a, a very clear exposition of the issues. Uh, here in Ireland, of course, we were very late arrivals to, to the whole debate. Fifteen years ago, uh, I walked into the Immigration Service of the Department as a junior official and it wasn't an issue at all. We've learned a huge amount in 15 years and we've been able to benefit from the experience of other countries. And uh, all the issues we spoke about today are very much live in our radar and what we do every day with, our, with the government and with the minister. So we're learning all the time from that. I was very taken by what you said about Schengen and uh, uh, I think you made a point or somebody made a point that if we had a choice would we be in Schengen or would we be out of it? Of course we would be in Schengen, I think it's pretty well known, but clearly we're well to the uh, UK position in terms of the common travel area. And the, ba the, ba the balance of our benefit at the moment is with uh, the common travel area. But my question is, do you sense any shift in movement in political terms in the UK about uh, joining Schengen? No. I'm very much a minority voice. Um, I think, in fact, the whole European debate in Britain is in an extremely bad place. Um, both on the euro issues, on the economic issues, and so on. Um, I blame Labour to a significant degree for this, because we didn't take on the issues positively enough when we were in government, in my view. Um, but the current government is also uh, exacerbating some of those issues. And classically, David Cameron's veto at the European Council in November last year, I think is very serious. Now, I was saying over, over lunch, I think that one of the things that's happened is that for the last 30 years I've seen European politics, most of the other main European countries have wanted the UK to be part and hoped that the UK would come round to do it and taken uh, confidence from the rhetoric of even John Major, um, Heart of Europe, Tony Blair and so on, that they thought we would be there. And I think for the first time I've seen, I, saw, I was in Berlin just, um, just at the time last year, saying, well, if you're not interested, we're not interested. And that will lead to a whole freezing of a whole set of relationships where goodwill won't be there, which I think will be very damaging to the UK. Now, for you, who are tied in the common travel area for reasons which I completely understand and respect, 
uh, that then has knock-ons for you because obviously you joined the euro um, and the, you've had to go through this very difficult period uh, in the last three or four years. Uh, it seems to me relatively successfully, but you'll no doubt tell me I'm, uh, whether I'm right or, or not about that, that the consequences of a UK frisson with the rest of the EU for Ireland could potentially be difficult and require, I would say, from your point of view, some thinking through of where you are on these questions. It's been possible, uh, and I, th I think there is a case, for Ireland to, in its conversations with the UK to quite seriously say, look, we want good relations with the rest of the EU, and so please would you conduct yourself in a way that makes that easier rather than more difficult. Um, but obviously the British government sovereign will decide what it's going to do, and it won't listen... Uh, it certainly won't listen to me, and it may not even listen to you um, in, in the situation. And uh, we'll, have to see, uh, we'll have to see what happens. But I feel quite gloomy about it. Um, that's why I make... The, the, it's another reason I wrote this pamphlet, because everybody's obviously focused on the economic issues, the euro and the eurozone and so on, quite rightly so. But actually there's a wide range of other issues where we need to have strong cooperation with our colleagues in the EU, not just these, but things like in the, the environment... Uh, uh, foreign, common foreign policy. It's still ridiculous. We haven't even got all the EU countries agreeing whether to recognise Kosovo or not. Could we have a positive approach on Syria? Could we have a positive approach on many international questions? And we need to work, in my opinion, we need to work as an EU as a whole. Now, you've taken the stance, Ireland has taken the stance very much that that's where you want to be. You're one of the main protagonists and beneficiaries of the European relationship. Obviously very difficult economically now. But in this area of justice and home affairs, you've given priority, as I say, rightly in my opinion, to the common travel area. But I think it, you'll be put under some pressure if the UK doesn't continue to have a good relationship with the uh, rest of the EU. And I, I'm, I worry about that at the moment. Charles, thank you. Thank you very much indeed.